mean, you can either feed, you know, purchased feed uh, to the cages, or you can let them free range and get eggs. <laughs> you know, yeah. the only way you're going to get eggs is yeah. if you free range them. Well, welcome everyone to the Poultry Podcast Show. My name is Doug Corver and I'm the host of this episode. And we're happy to welcome uh, Dr. Jackie Jacob from uh, the University of Kentucky. She is the Poultry Extension Project Manager in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences at the University of Kentucky. So welcome, Jackie. Thank you. It's good to have you here. Um, can you give a bit of a background on how you got to where you are now? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a crazy background. Um... I originally wanted to be a physical therapist, grew up in British Columbia on the Vancouver Island and uh, went to the University of Victoria. I tried to get into the physical therapy program. Uh, you have to do a few years of biology first. Um, I didn't get in, so I had to come up with plan B. And um, I was taking, you know, general biology classes, which I thought was, you know, too general. It didn't, I, I needed something applied. And so I decided to go into animal science. And um, by then my family had moved to the Fraser Valley. And um, when I went home for summer, um, I worked at the Agassiz Research facility and um, decided, yeah, I really did like the, the animal science. So um, after two years of general biology at, at University of Victoria, I transferred to UBC and joined the animal science department. Um, I, uh, I worked through school, so uh, I worked at the genetics research facility for quail with Dr. Uh, Roberts, who was uh, in charge at the time, and decided that um, you know everybody had to do an undergraduate thesis, and I decided I wanted to be a geneticist. So um, I switched from animal science to poultry science so that I could work with Dr. Roberts in uh, genetics. And the day my transfer became official, he had a heart attack on campus and died. So aside from being um, devastated that I lost a friend, um, I also lost the opportunity to become a geneticist. So, you know, went to plan C. So um, I, you know, I enjoyed working with the poultry at the Agassiz Research Station. I pretty much did it every summer. Um, and so I went with uh, Dr. Um, Fitzsimmons um, and did general um, poultry management. And um, so then that's how, that's how I finished my degree. And then I, um, I've always wanted to go to Africa since I was a little kid. I always, I always told my parents, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to Africa. And um, you know, I watched all the Tarzan movies and the <laughs> Wild Kingdom and, you know, totally unrealistic things of what Africa looked like. But, you know, I dreamt I was always going to go to Africa. And so with CUSO, which uh, used to stand for Canadian University Services Overseas, um, and they took university graduates. Now they take a lot more people and they don't use the, they just go by CUSO if they still exist, I'm not sure. Um, Cause this was like 40 years ago. So um, they had a job opening in Mozambique, which I had to find on a map, um, but it was in Africa. So I applied, got the job and um, signed up for a two year contract to volunteer in, um, in Mozambique. And um, after about 18 months, I got really sick so uh, they sent me back um, for you know healthcare here, and I, I, I hate to leave things incomplete. So um, I wanted to go back, and the only way with just six months left on the contract that they would do that was to sign up for another year. So I did that, and so I went back um, 
after I went back, the uh, French Canadian who was on the project for plant science, uh, he got attacked. There was a civil war going on at the time that we were there. And uh, he got his car that he was riding in got ambushed and um, the, the driver got shot and the passenger beside him died. Um, so he was devastated and uh, left. Um, but I stayed, so, you know, <laughs> that, that changed things a lot. And then uh, I ended up signing up for yet another year, stayed four years, and then I worked in the office for uh, six months to try and save up money to go back to school. I decided that working overseas, you needed more um, information on poultry nutrition because we were mixing our own feeds with ingredients I never heard of before. And, and so I was just going to come back for a master's degree. Um, and I worked with Dr. Bragg, who was the head of the poultry science department, to, to develop a program s specializing in third world development. Um, but by the time I was accepted and the time I got there, poultry and animal science departments merged into a single department and Dr. Bragg was not chosen as the head of the new department and so he quit. And so Dr. Robert Blair became the new head of the, depart of the joint department. He was the head of the animal science department and so I worked with him on some sudden death syndrome research uh, that took longer than normal because of equipment problems. And he was uh, working with the University of Nairobi in Kenya to bring their students to UBC to get more advanced degrees. Um, they are faculty members, but they didn't have advanced degrees. Uh, most of them were just veterinarians with a bachelor's degree. Um, and so while he was there, he said, you know, I have this student who would like to come the other way. So um, they sort of felt obliged to take me. And um, that one of the faculty there had done his PhD under Dr. Blair. So I worked with him uh, on my um PhD research at the University of Nairobi, looking at alternative feedstuffs. Um, came back and graduated, did my postdoc uh, in pigs and poultry, some work in Edmonton, uh, too cold there for me, um, <laughs> especially after Africa. Uh, and then when I started trying to look for a job, there weren't, a, I la, I'm a people person and I wanted to be involved in extension. Most universities don't do that in Canada, or at least they didn't when I was there. Um, and they had an opening for a poultry nutritionist at the University of British Columbia. And they didn't even interview me. They hired a rat person. Um, she did rat nutrition stuff and didn't know anything about poultry. So I thought, well, no, time to leave. So <laughs> there was a position in, um, in Florida. So it was an entry level position uh, with extension. So um, I went there. Um, originally, I agreed to stay for two years because I was overqualified for the position. But anytime you applied for faculty positions at American universities, they were looking for reasons because there were so many applicants at the time and applying from Canada was a red flag. So um, applying for jobs from Florida was, you know, that red flag was not so bad. Um, but I ended up staying uh, almost five years. Uh, I loved it, but then they were going to shut down the poultry program. So I got a job at the University of Minnesota. It was a faculty position. Um, I stayed there for seven and a half years, didn't get tenure. So I came to Kentucky, um, again, an ex extension position. And um, I've been here for almost, well, over 15 years now. So 
obviously I like it here. So um, it I'm allowed to do whatever I want. So. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's nice to have that freedom. Yeah. Your partner in improving animal performance, Berg and Schmidt. They believe the following additives are necessary in the poultry dietary. Functional lipids for an efficient dietary energy management. Phospholipids for emulsification, achieving a better nutrient intake. MCTs to provide energy and modulate the microflora within the intestines and enzymes for elevated use of fibrous materials and byproducts. So you've had a very, uh, I don't know if circuitous is the right word, but you've had a uh, maybe a non-traditional pathway to to your current position. So, um, can you tell me more about some of the countries that you've you've worked in uh, around the world? Um, well, when Mozambique at the time that I was there, um, it it was in a civil war, and so we couldn't see much um, because we weren't you know we had to be very careful where we went, how we got there, and things like that. Um, and, you know, some of the safety things were like, you know, you had to check with the ag office to see if, you know, if there'd been any attacks at near one of the cooperatives you want, you were going to. Um, and that just meant it hadn't happened yet. That didn't mean it couldn't happen. <laughs> and so, you know, they'd say, oh, yeah, nothing's happened at, you know, Jacina Michelle, you can go there. And then, you know, we got there one time and we were we we got there 10 minutes after they left <laughs> they, oh, wow. the uh truck they set on fire was still burning <laughs> so um you know it w you know i was young and stupid and you know we all you know we nothing could happen to us right so um but we worked with um um there was me and a French Canadian that were working on a project where we worked with um, existing cooperatives, agriculture cooperatives. And the idea of the project was to take excess corn and make feed. And instead of selling it, you know, feed it to their chickens and have a value added product. Mm -hmm. The problem was that when we got there to start the project, a drought was going on at the time. And so there, they could hardly eat, let alone have excess, you know, to feed to their chickens. So, um, you know, the, the mighty Limpopo River, which, you know, is usually this huge big river going through um, next to the research station there, you could walk across it right? There was no water. So mm -hmm. um, we did creative ways of getting uh, chicken feed um, from the capital city, and we had our own feed mill. So we got a lot of expired seed that they couldn't plant because of the drought. And uh, we got a lot of um, American uh, food donations that couldn't get to the people affected because of, you know, blown up train tracks or, or whatever. So that's where I say trying to mix these feed ingredients that, you know, all I had was a local name for it sometimes was yeah. a, um, a challenge to say the least. Um, did have a PhD that was coordinating the project from the capital city. So he helped us uh, a, quite a bit with that. So, um, but we had the, a research station for trying new feedstuffs. We had uh, a breeding facility uh, with a hatchery um, and um, we raised uh, dual purpose birds that we uh, did a sex link cross so you could sex males and females based on feather color, sell the females for to the cooperatives for egg production and then the other ones for meat um, and we had ducks um, mostly muscovy ducks that they could breed and raise up for sale um, we had a research facility for them as well um, and then of course we had the feed mill uh, that we um, worked as well so um, it kept us busy um, yeah. 
trying to do that while not getting blown up or shot. So, um, yeah, I enjoyed that. And then um, when I came back and did my PhD research, I did it in Kenya. And, um, you know, we don't get a lot of information in Canada about, you know, international situations. And I did not realize the political strife that was going on in Kenya. It was always, you know, touted as the the safe place to be in Africa. Right? <laughs> I was there three weeks and they were rioting in the streets. Um, somebody got shot just outside the university gates. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty rough for a while there. Um, government corruption, um, killing off um, competitors and, you know, all sorts of things that were going, lots of riots, but um, the students do most of the rioting, the undergraduate students. And so they kicked them all out of the university. And mm -hmm. so uh, it actually worked out for me because there was no competition for lab space. <laughs> with the undergraduate lab classes. So yeah. they actually finished in 21 months instead of 24 months. Um, and I had a, a scholarship um, to do all the research in Nairobi uh, and pay for my living expenses. Um, I only pay $25 a month for uh, the room. So <laughs> that wasn't too bad. <laughs> had a little bit extra to, you know, go on safaris and, you know, see the wild animals and that kind of stuff. So yeah. for most of the part, it was quite safe to see. Yeah. And they had a reasonably good uh, research facility. So um, I think the, the biggest impact that I had while I was there was that um, the other graduate students saw that I did all my own work. I didn't hire people to do my work, even though I had the money for it. Yeah. Um, a lot of them hired people to do their work, the weekends and, you know, anything else. And then when the studies were over and they were trying to analyze the data, they couldn't explain it because right. it, it didn't make a lot of sense. And so they'd come up to me and say, Jackie, you know, why do you think this happened? <laughs> and my answer was usually, you know, somebody probably stole a bag of feet. If you'd done it yourself, yeah. you would have known what had happened. But because somebody else did it, you don't know if they didn't show up that day um, or if they showed up and took some feed or, you know, you don't know anything because you didn't right. do it yourself. Yeah. Um, and so, they all started doing the, the work themselves. <laughs> of course, the yeah. people that they used to hire were probably pissed at me for you know, <laughs> losing a job. <laughs> but right. um, at least taught them that if you want to do it and know that it's done right, you got to do it yourself. So um, just because you're an advanced degree doesn't mean you can't do the work. Right, yeah. So how about after uh, your, your graduate program um, and in the years since um, you've worked in a, a lot of different countries around the world. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? In Florida, I met uh, an extension person there. And when I moved to Minnesota, he got asked to go with Favica, which is a Florida-based um, farmer-to-farmer program that takes volunteers um, mostly into the Caribbean at the time. And he couldn't go, so he recommended me because uh, he knew I'd worked overseas before. And so um, they asked me to go to Haiti. And so I jumped at the chance to go. I was, was working in Kentucky then. And my boss let me um, do whatever I want. So um, he said I could go to Haiti. Um, I, stay, I didn't have to take holidays. Um, so that I was employed by the university, his idea being that I had university insurance, and if I died in Haiti, they'd bring back the body. Because, <laughs> you know, Haiti was pretty rough then. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, so I got the, the position. It was, uh, I think it was like 10, 12 days, I can't remember. But um, it was a, a really 
weird project. They put, I was helping a group of people on an island off the, the north coast of Haiti uh, who bought chickens and then um, were having trouble with egg production. So they wanted me to help them figure out, you know, why their hens weren't laying eggs. So <clears throat> to get to this isolated area, okay, I flew from Lexington, Kentucky to um, Atlanta, Atlanta to, uh, no, to Miami, Miami to um, Port-au-Prince, which is the capital of Haiti. At Port-au-Prince, I got picked up by the translator and um, accompanying person and taken to the domestic airline and flew from Port-au-Prince to port au Pay, which is in the north. Um, and then we got met by uh, motorcycles who took us and our luggage to the, um, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a port, but um, to the docks <laughs> where there was a boat. Uh, I think that trip, we actually had a motorboat and then it was like a three or four hour um, ride to the island in the motorboat. By then it was, of course, pitch dark and raining like, you know, cats and dogs. And um, we got met at the bottom of the island by a, with a pickup truck. And then we rode up the mountain on these goat trails um, that, you know, sometimes only three wheels were on the, <laughs> on the roads. <laughs> got up there and stayed there and then worked with uh, them for four or five days. Their main problem was that um, they uh, couldn't get feed to the island. So they were just feeding maize. That was it. Mm. And so they were housed in cages and just fed maize. So they were very fat chickens uh, who weren't laying eggs. And so, you know, I told them you can either feed, you know, purchased feed uh, to the cages, or you can let them free range and get eggs. <laughs> you know, yeah. the only way you're going to get eggs is yeah. if you free range them, you know, split them up amongst yourselves, whatever you need to do. <clears throat> and then we came up, came up with some alternative feed stuff, some local stuff to supplement, to make sure that they were getting what they needed um, by foraging. So, because mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot there. Yeah. Um, not a lot of bugs or, you know, because it was a mountain. So, um, yeah. and then we, we walked down the mountain. I almost didn't make it because <laughs> I had a bad knee. Uh, spent the day on the beach and then I went, you know, the reverse all the way back. So, and then the next year they asked me to go again to the same people because uh, and bring uh, some incubators. Um, one for them, one for a, for a group in port au Pay, um, and then um, getting my trips mixed up because I went five times. Um, I took the two incubators with me, the, just the tabletop type, um, and the the island had solar panels that they were going to use for the incubators. Um, and I did the whole, you know, route to get there, but instead of a motorboat, it was a sailboat. Um, and, it, and instead of staying at a private home, I stayed at a, the mother of a volunteer that was with us. Mm -hmm. And she moved from the U S back to Haiti to, to help, her community. Um, but the problem was that when we flew from Port-au-Prince to port au Pay, the boat, the plane got too heavy. So they left some luggage behind, which was mine. Oh. Which was the incubators <laughs> and my clothes. So <laughs> it was really hard to teach them about incubators when I didn't have them. Right. So, Poor guy had to go all the way back down the island to the back to Port-au-Pay the next day 
and they brought up the incubators, but not my luggage. So at least I could, you know, show them how to use the incubators. Um, right. So that, you know, that worked. And then um, the next day he had to go back and get my luggage. <laughs> so um, I was borrowing clothes and, you know, whatever from everybody. And my luggage arrived the day we went back down the island to um, spend the day on the beach and come back. So uh, that was, you know, crazy. And then yeah. then I went and uh, we went to a um, resort, an island resort. I mean, we're talking, you know, fancy resort. Their idea was that um, they would um, use the scraps from the hotel mm -hmm. to feed their chickens um, and, um, sell the eggs to the hotel. And so, um, we went through feed ingredients and, you know, things that they could feed them to minimize expense. Cause it's an Island and trying to get feed to the islands always difficult, but we sat down and did the math, right? with yeah. what does this cost you? What does this cost you? How much can you sell it for? You know, that kinds of things. And when we did it, they couldn't make any money. Mm. So, um, you know, they agreed that that was stupid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It was not a well thought out project. Right. The concept was good, but being on an island was uh, very difficult for them to uh, figure it out. Um, so that that one didn't work. Yeah, when you're when you're dealing with uh, um, you know uh, developing countries and and poorly developed uh, supply chains and things like that, it it forces you to be a little bit creative, and and sometimes even that creativity uh, uh, isn't enough to overcome the the challenges. So um, so let's talk now about what you're doing in in Kentucky in your extension work in Kentucky. Okay. Um, well. Uh, the U.S. has what's called a land-grant system, and University of Kentucky is a land-grant university. And so they have a three-pronged approach to operations. So they have, the, of course, the teaching, because it, it's a university, research that pays for everything, um, and the extension. And extension is outreach, um, and it can be to anybody in the community. And so mm -hmm. my position is 100% outreach, 100% extension. I do help coordinate and teach the poultry management course. Mm -hmm. There's three of us that team teach that uh, in the spring every year. And then um, when I first got here, I did a lot of uh, applied research because I work with small and backyard flocks who are interested in heritage birds and there's not a lot of data on heritage birds and they're interested in pasture. So we did some pasture research with heritage birds. The, um, we built hoop houses and you know moved them all the time and the workers hated it and said they'd never do it again. So <laughs> that was, I wasn't able to do that anymore, but I did do some, uh, indoor applied research as well. Um, when that grant uh, dried up, most of my um, work that's related to research is as the extension component of somebody else's research. So okay. I am the coordinator for the National Cooperative Extension Service online program. Um, we have what's called a community of practice um, who you know that works with a community of interest which is small and backyard flocks uh, and so i coordinate that and uh, in order to get some of the competitive grants that different people apply for uh, one you need more than one state and you need an extension component and so mm. um, because i work nationally in extension i became the extension appointment for uh, several other universities. Um, we do monthly webinars that I coordinate. They're all recorded. We have articles online. I try to do a blog. 
Uh, I coordinate the poultry questions for ask extension um, so that, you know, I try to give them to other people, but they're supposed to get them out in 24 hours. If they don't answer the question in 24 hours, I usually answer it myself. Um, and then um, I'm also the a question wrangler for the University of Kentucky's extension service. So um, I take uh, questions that are from Kentucky and assign them to the correct county extension agent um, to do that. Um, what else do I do? I do the 4-H program at the in the United States. The 4-H program is run through the land grant universities, mm -hmm. and so uh, I do the poultry programs. We have uh, five competitive uh, events that we do. We do the um, avian bowl contest, which we have a national avian bowl manual that they draw questions from. We do a state contest, and then the top senior team can go to the national contest, uh, which uh, Kentucky hosts in uh, Louisville. Uh, I'm the secretary for that committee. Um, and then we have poultry judging, uh, which is not like a poultry show. It's, you know, judging carcasses, eggs. Um, the only live birds are past production hens, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we have a chicken and turkey barbecue contests, and we have the Egg Chef Challenge. So I coordinate the training of the kids to participate in the programs. Then I hold, the, I, I coordinate the running of those contests, and then I train the winners, the top seniors, to go to the national event. Um, and then, of course, I help run the, some of the national events. Um, I write articles, I write newsletters, I try to, uh, well, I do develop curriculum. Right now we have a big curriculum we just did um, on farm to school for poultry meat. We got a grant for that. Uh, it's just gone through review, so I have to do the um, corrections for that and then uh, send it out to agents for review. Um, I've done some egg curriculum called the Egg and I. I've done, uh, I'm working on project books for the 4-H kids. Um, so far we've done a pullet project, a layer project. I'm working on a broiler project and purebred chickens. Um, we have a showmanship contest at the state fair uh, just for Kentucky 4-H that I coordinate as well. And of course, gonna have training sessions for that. Uh, yeah, in the summers, I've been running 4-H um, barbecue camp. Summer is my biggest time because I would I go to about 12 different counties. I take all the grills, all the cooking equipment, everything that they need to, you know, um, do the contest. And then we have a practice where they learn how to cook the meat, both the chicken thighs and ground turkey for turkey burgers. Um, and I can have kids anywhere from eight to 18 participating at the same time. Um, and I take 20 kids, so I can do up to 20 kids. So I'm usually running ragged uh, from one end of the state to the other, uh, and usually in the month of uh, June, because we get out of school at the end of May. And then July, is my poultry judging workshops in the counties uh, and then they're back to school in August and I can <laughs> get ready for the national contest in November. So yeah. um, I rarely stop. <laughs> yeah, it I, sounds like you're, you're busy. So. Uh, yeah, most of it's computer if I'm not in the field. So that's right. why working from home works really great. Yeah, so uh, it sounds like you've got a really strong online presence with blogs and, and answering questions. Um, did you have that before COVID or did COVID kind of change or, or force you to do things a little differently? No, we, we had the, the, um, the e-extension is what they call the electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension. I've been doing that for 10 years now. Mm -hmm. So our monthly webinars, the, the blog, the ask extension, that was all set up like 10 years ago. 
Okay. Um, we got more traffic um, when COVID hit, um, but we also get a lot of international participants in it. Um, you know, some come at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> for our three o'clock in the afternoon webinars. Yeah. Um, I started doing Kentucky webinars, um, which I, during COVID, because I used I used to do them in the counties themselves um, on small flocks. But um, when we couldn't do that with COVID, we started doing some online ones. I have gone back to doing a few um, regional ones uh, at the request of the agents. Um, but we have stuck with coming up with. Um, March, April um, webinars. We have two types of webinars series. One is for small and backyard flocks. So people who have three, maybe, you know, 50 chickens at the most. Um, and then um, a small commercial operations so that we make sure that they're following egg law. So nobody's getting sick from eggs. Um, you know, making sure that there's Pro, you know, raising chickens and turkeys or and ducks or whatever um, problem is getting them processed in order to be allowed to sell them. Uh, right. The laws here are quite rigid uh, in Kentucky compared to other states. So we do Kentucky specific ones um, and we'll probably stick with that, um, but still doing the ones in the counties as well. It's time for our famous three. One of AB Vista's core strategies is to give customers the flexibility to do more with less, which is a common theme among many companies and producers in today's industry. As a science-driven company, AB Vista has proven results to help our customers achieve optimal performance using customized programs with our core phytase and xylanase. So Early on your in your training, uh, you encountered a lot of obstacles. I mean, you 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 talked about that. Um, so, what advice would you have for uh, a young person, maybe early in a grad program or considering a grad program? Uh, what advice would you have if they're uh, running into some problems or, or concerned about potential obstacles? Uh, well, I didn't really see them as obstacles, as more as opportunities. Um, because, you know, when I first started, um, I, I, I was fixed. I'm going to do this, right? This is my goal. I'm going to do this and nothing but this. And then you, you hit the obstacle and you look around and there's a lot of other options that you hadn't even thought about. Um, and so, um, you know, I would never be where I was if I'd become a physical therapist. <laughs> you know, just, uh, I don't know that I would have enjoyed it very much either, you know, but um, all of my opportunities, being able to go overseas, um, you know, doing the PhD that I hadn't planned on because I was just going to come back originally to take some courses. That was it. Uh, I got talked into doing the, the master's. If they're going to do a few courses, you might as well get your master's degree. Um, and then because of the equipment problems, it took three years instead of two. So I took all these extra courses mm -hmm. so that when I did my PhD, um, I didn't have to take any more courses because I'd taken them all. So, right. um, so while the, you know, the equipment was a pain in the butt, um, it gave me the opportunity to take more courses and, and then, well, why don't you do a PhD? Right. And then, Oh, look, you can go overseas to do it that you couldn't do for your masters, you know? So, yeah. um, always keep your, your, um, uh, eyes open for opportunities and, um, don't think that you just have to do one thing. I mean, I've seen people who, um, I want a job with this company, right? This mm -hmm. company's paying for my postdoc. And when I finish, I want to work for that company. Well, that company has decided they don't want you, right? And that person turned down really good jobs, but they weren't that company. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, she messed herself up because she gave up on opportunities 
because yeah. she was fixated on what she wanted. So some of the creativity and flexibility that served you well in your uh, work internationally um, maybe uh, is uh, uh, something that uh, allowed you to sort of shift directions or, or examine other opportunities. So yeah, that's, that's great to hear. Um, so you deal a lot with young people. Uh, if someone is interested in a career uh, like yours, where you work with industry and, or you, you have international opportunities, are there organizations or resources that you recommend to young people that, that are interested in, in the kind of work that you do? Well, a lot of it depends on whether you're in Canada or the U S um, the U S has a lot more opportunities that, uh, I'm aware of, I don't know of the Canadian opportunities cause I haven't lived there for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the, um, in the U S with the land grant university, depending by this on the States, every County has agents in it. Mm -hmm. Kentucky has 120 counties and each one has a County agent, at least one, but, uh, they usually have an ag agent, a family and consumer sciences agent, and a 4-H agent. Um, and so uh, there's lots of opportunities to get a job as a 4-H agent yeah. um, or an ag or family and consumer sciences and work with kids. Um, if you're living in a community, there's usually a 4-H agent desperate for a volunteer to run uh, a club uh, in the, you know, through their office, they can give you support, but they just, you know, the 4-H agent can't do everything. They need volunteers. They provide volunteer training, um, of which I also do a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of. Um, and then, um, so that's for, you know, working for youth for international. Um, Farmer to Farmer is a U.S. aid uh, funded um, program, uh, which is in the farm bill, the U S farm bill. So it, you know, it always going to go on. It's, it's a line item in the farm bill, um, and different organizations contract with farmer to farmer. So, uh, most recently I was in Zimbabwe, um, you know, helping indigenous, um, poultry production improve by finding local feed ingredient, uh, I went back to Mozambique for one project, which was great. Um, again, an egg production problem that they were having, uh, not feeding enough and other things. Um, but, you know, what, when I went to, um, oh, it was Guatemala, uh, a French guy who was working in uh, California somewhere, I think it was Davis, but I'm not sure, he had found out about it um, and had come and he was working there on a different project altogether. We mm -hmm. just happened to trans travel at the same time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, any university here, can, they're looking for specialists to help solve problems. They have a website where they post all the different types of, of jobs open to them. So, you know, whatever your area of expertise is um there's usually a job been to bangladesh um you know that was an experience but um they pay for all your travel expenses mm -hmm. they don't pay you but they pay for your tra <laughs> travel right. expenses yeah. they do give you travel insurance and then as i said my boss insures i have travel insurance from uh the university as well um mm -hmm. and they uh, notify the U.S. Embassy that you're there. So, you know, if anything happens, uh, you get airlifted uh, mm -hmm. out. Um, some of the places have been a little bit hot. Um, but right now they're they're pretty good. So yeah. I, just, I can't go back to Haiti anymore. It's not it's too hot The right. yeah. the U.S. Embassy won't let you and my university won't let me. So it's it's too hot. But. Jamaica yeah. was nice. I can go back to Jamaica. That'd be good. <laughs> so, so there's lots of opportunities if students are interested in uh, international development projects. Um, so, yeah, that's that's great to hear. But to work internationally, you have to be flexible. You have to think outside the box because all the 
projects that I've helped with, nutrition has been the problem. And it's getting local feed ingredients so that they're not importing uh, expensive feeds. Um, so, you know, you got to think outside the box. Yeah. And a lot of people can't do that. So, <laughs> Well, this has been really interesting, Jackie. And uh, thank you for your time today and uh, for your time on the Poultry Podcast Show. Um, thank you to our listeners for joining us and uh, hopefully that uh, uh, sparks some interest in uh, possibilities with international development work related to, to poultry. So thank you for joining us and I'll see you next time on the Poultry Podcast Show.